Hello, Blazer fans, and welcome back to another Blazer Solar Power Hour. Yeah, Where did so, we leave off with the dashboard last? Let's take a look. So let's get it up on the screen. Um, we added last week a tile layout with some persistent state. So we could rearrange our dashboard, and then when we leave and come back to the dashboard page, it would have the same uh, layout that we left it in. Let's see, we need to add some data before this actually looks useful. And oh, wow. Our charts are starting to move now. And I have to mention, right, so everyone, we're trying live share, do Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. I have the command window open on my side. You started debugging. I have an instance yeah. of command running, and I can see the live data coming in. Nice. That's amazing. Yeah, that surprised me too. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so it opened the browser in your it uh, did not machines as well? Browser. No. I think you can somehow. There's, there's like a button um, over on this side. But this is ideal because I would rather see your browser so that we're all on the, you know, watching the stream with you guys. We can see your browser, but at the same time, the back end stuff is better for me to see. If you're not familiar with Live Share, it's a way for Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code users to share a session and do some uh, pair programming uh, with a connection in um, Visual Studio where it like syncs up everybody's. Uh, Visual Studio instances. It's pretty neat stuff. It's been kind of in the works for a while. It's it's starting to hit a sweet spot. It looks like where it's um, kind of flawlessly working right now. There's a way for you guys to actually pull up the app too, and I'm trying to remember how to do it. Now I think you guys can pull uh, it up under shared servers. Yeah, open server and browser. If you right click on it. Yeah, you could also go up to search and this search live share and pull up the panels but uh let's see we've got our dashboard up and running here um oh this flipped it was negative a second ago the battery power yep so that means oh. pulled a little bit from the battery for a moment so maybe it got cloudy or something and yep. stopped generating power or sometimes oh. I say like the refrigerator turns on and the combination oh, of yeah. what's being generated by the solar panels is not enough. So it pulls a little bit from the battery to cover the difference. Interesting. Yeah, you're not pulling anything off the grid right now. We've got a, almost 100% battery charge. These are all real uh, numbers, yeah. by the way, folks. Um, for those watching at home, this is at yeah. uh, Lance's... Uh, home in uh, Costa Rica, right? Yep. Very cool. It's up in the mountains, so um, it's usually a good view of the sky. Only time that there's issues, so there are clouds. But the cool thing about these panels is that they will generate electricity even when it's cloudy. It uses the infrared light, I believe, and um, could be UV, but I think it's infrared. But either way, it, you, we still get some juice out of it. And what I mentioned earlier about negative, I was backwards. So if the value is negative, then it is charging. If it's positive, it is draining. So if you look oh. right now, we have load power. The house is using 200 and 238 watts. The solar panels are making 752 watts. What's left over is going into the battery. So yeah, so it is cloudy. It just jumped up to over a kilowatt from the solar panels. So oh, wow. cloud probably went over the house. <laughs> nice. All right. Okay. So uh, we we talked about persistent state. So if I move this panel over here, load power is now in front. If I refresh the page, load power stayed where it is. So we have our persistent state set up on our panels. So that's getting saved off to local storage. Um. We want to talk about a different kind of storage today. We're going to save some of the data, which you can see streaming in here. We want to save some of this off to a database so we can do more dashboarding at a later time, see trend lines and things like that. Can't really see trends right now because we're not saving anything that's coming in. We're just showing live data, right? Exactly. All right. So I'm going to kill the app. It's Pulling in a lot of data right now. 
and uh, let my machine breathe here and uh, we'll look at some code. So we need to start adding some, some backend stuff to uh, save data to. Um, I think we're going to use what SQLite? Is that what we decided on, Lance? Yeah, um, we can switch it to SQL Server at another time, but SQLite is a nice, easy way to get started, lightweight. And to change it to SQL Server later is just one line of code in the program CS file. So we're going to use Entity Framework, which is makes all of this a bit easier. Yeah, I've seen a lot of conversation on any framework lately. It's like it's one of those love-hate relationships. Like either people Absolutely. love it or they hate it and they want to do everything in SQL themselves. Um, I've used it pretty successfully, so I don't have an issue with that. I love any framework. It gets the job done. Uh, what, are, what are some of the first things that we need to do to get this going? I know we need to add some dependencies. We don't have the capability to save anything to any kind of database or connect or do anything with just ASP.NET proper. We need more more bits yep. to do that. So the one that we want to start with is um, we want to add the NuGet package Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQLite. Microsoft Entity Framework. Or the SQLite one, though. Uh, it'll pull the core one in as a dependency. But there's a lot of extensions. It might, you won't see this at the top. Yeah, there you go. It'll probably come up better that way. Take off pre release, too. It's really slow today. Like, I don't know what's, maybe it's all the streaming or what, but package manager is really slow. Uh, I, don't, I don't see the SQLite. I pasted the full name into the chat. Yeah, let me try that. <laughs> that usually works better. The search on NuGet packages isn't the best. And you actually, yeah, like, I those three terms are pretty popular. So, yeah. There you go. That's probably um, it right there. Yeah, and the top one. Uh, like you said, it has a dependency on, and I'm looking down at the lower right hand corner of the screen here, uh, Entity Framework Core or SQLite.core. Yep. And then that will have an entity, that will have a dependency on the other packages we need. So to keep things yeah. easier and, and keep your sanity better, just pick the top one and let NuGet uh, dependency resolution handle that. Now, should we read through the license agreement here? Does this mean like if I'm injured at a Disney park that I can't sue them? <laughs> just curious. <laughs> That's going to be my go-to dad joke from now on <laughs> after they pulled that bunch of shenanigans. Shame on you, Disney. All right. So that... So what do we do now? Right. Um, installed. We yeah. have that. There's two yeah. ways we can approach this. Um, we can think about, do we set it up now and pull in the service now? Like how we everything we do in program CS, or should we think about make sure our model is correct? first. I think we need to do the model part first because we don't have a context yet to use in program um, CS. Okay. So, do you want to drive? Wait. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Let's do that. Yeah, let's uh, let's see. I will change the screen at least here so we can see. There's our home.razor and then if I hit this button, I think you are in full driving mode now. So it will follow your cursor. And okay. if you open files, I believe it will open them as well. I can see everything in the solution explorer. So um, one thing I don't see here, and I'll ask you guys advice for this. So we need a models folder. We want something to put the data model for the actual data item and one for the DB context. Is it a good pattern to put the models folder at the top? Or inside the components folder. So, in in my opinion, if it is part of a specific feature, say it's part of the dashboard, something that really drives something on the dashboard, I'd put it under a folder. If it's more generic, um, in this case, I think we're just saving out data that may or may not be displayed on the dashboard, uh, like the model for the database itself. I'd put in a different folder. Yeah. So. 
Right yeah, here. I don't have strong opinions on this either. Yeah, if it's a view model type of a thing, even though we don't normally call things view models in Blazor, just that's more of an MVVM thing. But if it's technically a view model, I'd put it in a component folder. But if it's like a database model, I'd throw it in its own uh, its own folder. All right. So, so let's see, a models folder has appeared. Yeah. And what we'll do is we will create a class that holds the properties of this data coming in. And we'll call it MQTT data item. Now, if I open it, does it? Yeah, it does. Very yep, nice. It opened up. And then uh, I will show folks at home here. You've added a file under the models folder right there. And you're stubbing out some stuff for us for our database model. So this database model is going to represent basically a table in uh, in our database. What is the namespace of the project? You can go to one of the pages. It is Blazor Solar Power Hour. It's the top level namespace. And then we'll do models. The uh, key comes from um, the entity framework stuff. So I'm curious. Oh, no, we can do it from, yeah, let's make this easier. I don't have IntelliSense, so I'm kind of doing everything manual. Um, I have some comments in there that should explain what we're seeing. So okay. we, we're not getting an ID from the MQTT broker, right? So, mm -hmm. but it's a database and we want to have an easier way to look up these items and ID and int or a GUID is the best, usually the fastest way to do it instead of, because what if you have two values that are the same, you can't do it. You can't use topic to identify a unique item at maybe timestamp, but that's very intensive, like on the CPU to like look for each microsecond and find the one that's yeah. at that time. So uh, GUIDs are pretty portable too. If we decide yeah. we want to go with like um, uh, Cosmos DB or um, uh, another document database, the I the GUID is pretty common among document databases yeah. versus like integers. I don't think you use integers in a document database, at least not ones that I've seen. And the other three are data items we do get from the, the broker. So this is that model that we will create an instance of it to show stuff in the chart, to show stuff in the gauges. Because right now we're just doing it um, kind of a little bit ham-fisted where we just take the latest item and read it out and then put it on a particular thing. This makes the development much easier because we can get it as a type, strongly typed item and data bind or do whatever you want from there. We need to we need to get a hold of the Mark Logic folks and see if we can have a database there. That would work. Yep. That's a fine idea. Although I don't I don't think we have an EF connector for Mark Logic. We'd have to use a REST API, but that's another document style database. Okay, so the next thing I will add another file called the DB context. And the DB context is going to describe, like I said, I said the model represents the table, but it's more the DB context that's going to describe to EF how the class is represented as a table. Oh my, Meta, I just told you, remind me later. I didn't mean five minutes from now. <laughs> <laughs> that screen just popped up before the show started. Like usually those things wait a couple hours, not or next time you reboot, not uh, immediately after you press the button. Okay. You can scroll that to the top, or do I need to do that? Yeah, it oh interesting. Okay, I'll move my cursor to the top of the file, it'll zoom in. So essentially what's going on there is this is how the service works in .NET Core. A lot of the plumbing is abstracted away and makes it easy for you. All we're doing at the top is we're getting these DB context options, which 
helps you define how you want the table set up, which table to use, how things are generated. Um, and there are many examples online and in Microsoft Learn that show you the different ways to use it. In our case, we're just defining one table called measurements. And that is of type DB set, that data item class that we just created in the other file. So we'll get a table of these measurements and we can insert and delete and query it as much as we need to. So this will hold the history of all the live data that comes in. The thing I have at the bottom on line 27 is seed data is because um, it can be tricky sometimes to develop when there's no data that's already come in. So what mm -hmm. I have is just some sample average items that come in so that they represent the last three seconds in time. So at least the database will have some initial items to show on the chart and then we'll add on top of those. It changes in every version of any any framework, it feels like, but there's also a way to auto migrate these things without having to run the command line. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but uh, that can be pretty handy on apps that you're you're doing a lot of like demos or there are smaller projects where you're going to be, you know, maybe presenting it to, um, you know, multiple people, different sessions or standups or something. Yep. Matter of fact, we're going to do the auto migration today. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. Um, so if you notice, I opened programs. Yes. Yeah. So we have the two objects that we need for just a baseline of entity framework and interacting with the database. The class is the actual item in the data table. The DB context defines what data tables you want to use in a particular database. So how do we spin this up and Make sure we get the using statements in here first. I don't have any autocomplete or IntelliSense, so we'll hope some of this works. So we're referencing Entity Framework Core to get some of the abstraction, like extension methods, up yep. so we can add services and things, right? Okay, and we'll call the migration it has to be the same assembly. So, is a solar power hour. Okay, so we'll go back to the beginning of this line. So we are build, we are adding a service, and the pattern on this is a little different than the other kinds of services that you used to, like we have up here. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I have this in the wrong spot. Let's move it here. Oh, yeah. You want to get it above that build? Yeah. We want it before the app builder builds. So, yeah. So, if you notice the other services, we either create like a type, you know, um, and or you might have an extension method like this. Any framework has an extension method called add db context, which makes it a lot easier. And what you pass in there is the DB context class that we just created. And what are the options? I mentioned that those options get passed to the constructor. They are defined right here. So if we were to open this up a little bit. Probably better if we do it this way. Eh, it's all one line on each. I'll just keep it straight instead of being there we go. All right, so we're using SQLite. And then we have a couple parameters, it looks like. Yep. So this creates a file. SQLite works off local file system as a file. And this will check if this exists. Uh, if it doesn't exist, then it'll do a migration. It'll create the file and do a migration. So how does it know to do this migration? We have another one that runs in the app. Because this is a um, an ASP.NET app or ASP.NET Core app, there is no scope yet, right? A desktop mm -hmm. app, you have a scope. It's just one scope. The user is running the app. But as a web server, it can have multiple scopes. It can have multiple users running at the app at the same time. So there's no default scope other than we can create one right away with create scope. And this allows us to get an instance of the DB context from the service. So it calls the service and gets the DB context. 
and then we make sure that the database has been created. And if there are any pending migrations, it'll apply the migration. This is that automatic part that you were mentioning. And this is the part I said is different every time I've used it. Yep. It seems like every version of yep. EF Core, this syntax changes and gets either moved somewhere or just changes the way it's written. This is the, maybe the first time I've seen it written this way. I'll it's gotten a little cleaner, project. I think. But yeah, yeah, just about every time I have to look it up. There used to be a method inside of DB context itself that you had yep. to override. And it looks like they've they've moved it a little bit. And I don't think there's anything else. Static files, we have static files, that's good. Um I'm just checking against my proof of concept here. This is What's interesting this? for me that it's just gonna run the migration when we run the app instead of doing it manually. Uh, yeah, which I've seen, you know, usually through the command line, but I've also seen the option uh, you know, through the solution explorer to find the context and go ahead and run the migration and then and there's like some advantages <laughs> and disadvantages of that and i'll i'll, I'll show yep. you um what one of those is at least for me uh there, there's a reason i like this justin and i think so right now as we stand right now it will create the database create that table and it'll add those first sample ones in the initial migration um but we really don't have a way to see that yet. So I think maybe we should inject the service into our page and just maybe um, print out a list to the screen or something. So we need to, this part I always forget to. All right, so we go to home, which is where we have our stuff. And then we're gonna inject our data service. And I can't do auto. Can you do the um, auto resolve for those namespaces on your side? Yeah, let's see. So there you go. There we go. Yeah, control period again could not be found. So, oh, wait, nope. Oh, uh, in this project, I believe. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, actually, I have this backwards. I'm getting ahead of myself. So we don't need this here. This is actually a replacement of the other service that gets the items from the live part. Um, so yeah, let's step back and think about where we are now, right? So we have this database. Where do we want to save the items to? The database usually the service that's connected to the mqtt service and where do we have that now it is under mqtt ui service i believe oh uh, now we're kind of doing it all in the code behind and it's part of the issue too uh, yeah so why don't we do this let's add it because it's going to make our lives easier so i'll add the service to the project and then we can use it after that so add another service okay so i just saw the messages data service pop up in services yep you just added the class there's nothing in it yet but let me fix that up quickly And just copy it from the other one, data item, copy it from here. And then this one will be services. Yep. I like the new syntax here too. You don't have to wrap the entire yes. code base with like brackets on the, uh, namespace anymore okay so here's our um service that interacts with entity framework right we don't want every page we don't necessarily need to 
create the DB contacts and spin it up every time. So we have one service for the scope of the application. And then here we have a couple of helper methods. Um, it, it one that says get all measurements, get a specific measurement. And we're using the range of dates, right? We can say the last 30 days, 60 days or whatever. We have add measurement. And inside of each one of these, we are interacting with entity framework. But we don't have to worry about that for the rest of the app code. We just have this service class that does it for us. And a couple others, right? delete a measurement and update an existing measurement. And we use the ID to find it, right? So we use that GUID to find it in the database. And then we update the item and save it. But the this is the service class that we need to add to program two. Let me add that. And then we can inject it. So there are two services. We have the UI service, that is the MQTT UI service, and then we have the data service, which interacts with the database. This makes things a lot nicer. I don't yeah. particularly like doing DB context directly in my components. Exactly the one, yep. It makes them hard to test for one. I know we're not doing tests here. Maybe it's something we tack on later, even though that's probably not the best way to do it, but uh it gets really difficult if you're throwing db context directly in your components yep and also uh, think about the life cycle of having connections to the database you have open one page it makes a new connection open another page it makes a new connection and you might have crosstalk instead you have one service that its sole responsibility is to talk to the database through entity framework and then your application can say oh conveniently i can just inject the service and save or get things through the c-sharp pattern that i'm I'm used to using with an I enumerable. So that's exactly how we pull all of this in. So to step back, we added entity framework core. We defined a class that we're going to use for the data item. We defined a DB context that says um, what database table. And this context is used by entity framework to make a connection to the database. In our case, it's just a file. It's a local file because it's SQLite. That could be swapped out and just one line right here. So if we were using SQL Server, we would have another extension method that says use SQL Server. And then we put the connection string inside there. Of course, you wouldn't paste it in raw because you would use a secret, but there's basically just the same idea. Yeah, so if I could interject for a second, I think we're we're probably pretty used to the the pattern for the uh, for the DB context, but is there a a scaffolder to make that easy? Like, is, is there an add option and the solution? There are different now VS extensions. And just select yeah. the model. I can't see it on my side, but maybe, um, uh, maybe the scaffolding have tools. Uh, we could do, let's see, I think it's under add new scaffolded item. And then there's a razor component using entity framework and just a regular one. I have not used these myself. They're new, actually. I think at .NET 8, they dropped these. Um, yeah. I don't know what exactly they create. Yeah. But uh, we could try one after like a commit here or something and see what it creates and then roll it back. Cool. There's another scout folder, too, that will create the DB context from a model class. Um, it's, a, yeah. it's a Visual Studio extension. It's pretty cool. Um, so like any have power tools or something? Yeah, it's like entity framework power tools. I didn't yeah. know that was still around. <laughs> that okay. Like what I was uh, for. Is that what you were talking about, Justin? Yeah, yeah. Model, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, if you don't know exactly what to put inside of this, uh, where did it go, DB context? If you don't know what to put in here, it can be confusing, right? They yeah. how do I set all of this up? The power tools will give you the options. You can check the box and select different options to build out this class. Exactly. And it knows, that sounds like a nice tool. Yeah, it knows that you want this because that's the one you scaffold from. I don't know, guys. So at this point, um, I think I would hand it back to you. So we have the data service, which will allow you now to interact with the database save items as they come in 
or load items that are in the history, like when the app first loads again, like get the last two weeks of data or something. Um, let's make sure it builds and it injects. Yeah, it's going to say, we'll know if it's, uh, if we have a database at the end of this, uh, if we run it. Yeah. You should see a uh, DB, DB, um, SHM, and W something. There's we, three files. Did you try to run it, or did, do you need me no, to No, no, I'm handing it back to you guys. Okay, I'm going to run this. And, oh, there's a build error. Namespace cannot be found. Yeah. So we added this, but then never came back and hit the using on it. So there we go. It's back. And now we should be able to run. All right. There's our migration. Sweet. The app is running. It's off screen. I wanted to keep it focused here because we have uh, some outputs. This is where it is queuing up the seed data. So this is the any framework dropping in the seed data. I thought you had to put in something for it to write this stuff out to the console. Is this default behavior now to show the queries? I guess so, because I didn't um, explicitly tell it to. Well, maybe it's because it does X or and debug. Turn that on. Maybe it's part of the auto migration part. It's not going to show every SQL database call. That could be. I don't see it uh, saying anything about migrations, though. Like there, there used to be a mode where you could easily turn on an AD framework, um, like in a verbose mode, to see all the queries going through to kind of test it and make sure that the queries it's producing aren't like wild, like you know, bad performance yeah. queries. Um, you could also pull up like SQL, ser SQL Server Analyzer tools and do the same thing. But it was nice to be able to just like jump into the console and kind of check these things when they're you know, going in and out of the application. And then for some reason, like I can't remember if it was like .NET 6 or something that vanished and there was no way to do it. And then they brought it back and you had to like manually enable it and it was difficult to find. So I was kind of surprised to see it just on by default. And it's not something you necessarily want to have happening by default. Yeah. I'm so. thinking maybe it is only because of the migration, but we'll know if we try to add an item to the database. So uh, we were talking about this auto migration stuff. So you can see down here, it just outputs some database files right like that. And then uh, let's go over here. We've got uh, our connect our connection to our uh, live data. And then did you hook it up yet to where it's saving data back as it comes nope. in or no? Okay. Uh, that's yeah, that's what we'll there. do next. We just wanted to make sure that the migration succeeded. And now we can go to where we're listening to the MQTV service. And then we can just add each item as it comes in. So. so one thing I like about this auto migration thing is we didn't have to go to the console and type anything in because I can never remember the <laughs> commands for that. Just yeah. never can. And then um, this is an app that's more or less a demo app. So when you're doing a lot of demos, um, you might need to start from scratch pretty often. And what I can do is just come over to this measurements.db and hit delete and then hit OK. And I don't have to go back to the command line and run a bunch of stuff again. So I don't have to run the EF initialize command anymore from, from the command line. I just run the app again, and I get a brand new database back. So you can see that that code ran again. If I scroll down in my solution explorer, if it'll let me see it, there's my DB file. So it's back already. And I, I didn't have to do anything. I didn't break my app. And then, you know, another thing that's nice is if I push this up to GitHub and another user grabs it, 
they can easily just hit run and they get the database and they don't have to look into the docs and run like three console commands before they can run the thing they just cloned. Yeah. So that's always that's another answer. good reason for seed data too, because if they can't connect to a real service, you already gave them a bunch of sample data to see in the UI to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you can you can do some mocking and stuff as well with that yep. that data. All righty. Uh let's see here. So where are we uh, when we start connecting, when we're getting these data items in? So when you click to connect. So let's do a little tab bankruptcy here at the top. Love that. Those out. And then we're <laughs> going to go back to home, dot razor and home razor CS. Let's go ahead and put these side by side. All right, so we've got our on click toggle connection. And if I click on that, uh, we are queuing up a subscribed flag and we are calling subscribe async. And we're subscribing here. That gets um, that gets our home dot razor uh listening on this got message task so this is doing all the work right now a lot of if statements here we'll we'll yeah. probably be cleaning that up pretty soon right yeah i'm wondering if we should actually do that at the same time right now um let me try this let me paste in and we can probably swap it out if we make change the name to got message so uh home i'll do it at the very bottom so i don't get in the way we don't have the chart item yet let me add that class Ooh, there's a lot of cases in there yeah so i only did that because i used the feature that said um put a case for everything in the enum we should probably remove that for right now it's also easier to know what items you have like sometimes I'm like, what should I add to the app now? And I can scan down the enum members. But for this part, we can take this out for now. Um, and battery charge data and load power data, these become lists now. So currently we have, um, we don't have a collection to buy into a chart. So I'll just comment these out for now, but these are things we will want to add as lists to bind to line series, for example, mm -hmm. or I don't want to charge this party. Yeah, let me fix it up real quick. So here's the first part. On message receive is the equivalent of got message. I don't change that. Uh, we need to add system.txt. Where is that space? I'm pretty sure it's system.txt. Yeah. All right. We'll clean up the order of the using statements later. All right. What else are we missing? I will call this got message too. Is database enabled? So there's another thing I was concerned about while writing this. Like while we're testing frequently, um, Sometimes I wanted to not be writing to the database to corrupt it or whatnot. So I added mm -hmm. a quick little backing field where the default value is true, but we could disable it if we needed to. Let me put that in there real quick. And what else are we missing? Okay, this here, this chart, you, you might think, hey, I already have a data model for stuff that's coming in um, the MQT T data item. I found that I needed a little more flexibility for stuff that was being shown in the chart. It didn't work so well. Um, I will add it, but I think we can probably work over this. It's because we needed a category. When it comes to showing charts, 
you want a category of a data item. So let me add that really quick. I just put it at the bottom of this class for now. And then I should be able to move it to move on topic name. Okay, so we did not add the topic name and topic name helper. How did we parse this out before? We looked at it. Okay, we do have topic name. Oh no. You set it up as an enum in your but okay. where's our current on one? Your proof of concept, and we're, we're just dealing with you as a nullable string. Uh, yeah. in the current model. Okay, so we do have them under services. They probably should be under models, but we'll about that later. So that means we need to add the services namespace or something. What is current load? Oh, we just need to add a couple more fields for those items. We have these under a different name. What are those names? Good power, battery power, or battery charge percent, charge source priority, inverter mode. We have a couple of um, ones in here that we don't have cases for yet. Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, Visual Studio uh, added the control slash to comment now, just like VS Code. Yeah, I like, I like that. Like it's just see merge more of the hotkeys together, really. <laughs> also, okay. memory is hard to fix, man. Yeah. Here's what we'll do. All of this stuff I have under process data item, we are currently doing in the same place. So we're kind of combining the original got message. We're doing the process data item stuff. So when that when that thing comes in, we look at the topic name, and then we figure out which one it has to go and update and what part of the UI, and then we update the UI. Um, because there are more messages, and there's two stages. The one stage is to get the data item, save it to the database, and then update the UI. I broke it up into two methods. The first method is getting the message. Right? This is the function or the event handler of the service itself, the MQTT broker. But then there is the conceptual step of we are now to need to process this item. So the first stage is saving it, adding it to list or whatever. Second stage is updating the UI. Only thing I want to do is I'll probably take out. Did we do that part? No, no not every topic that comes in is both set to the UI and saved to the database, right? Well, we do want to save all the topics to the database. We may okay. or may not use it for the UI. That's kind of what this part is responsible for. Because we don't know later on that we want to do a line series for, let's say, you know, send back to grid power. By putting it into the database, then uh, we the data is there. Mm -hmm. So I guess what we can do is just not overcomplicate it, and we can say if the database is enabled, first thing we do is we cast it into the data item. Got the topic name. We did not get the value yet. Okay, so that's another issue too, is we're not parsing out the value until we're inside of a particular topic. Yeah, we're doing the payload, get the value here. So mm -hmm. this means that we're going to have to either repeat this line of code inside every statement or put it up one level and save the value ahead of time. So maybe we should do this here. And then we can use that value in the statement. So topic name. Rid of that. And see where we're using topic name. Here it is. What I can do is I can change that to your topic name. All right. Yeah, and 
Next step is we're going to save it to the database if it is enabled. Uh, we fix the lines in a second. And then we do something with the data. Now delete my other code. And we can worry about cleaning up the if statements and switch statements. I can do that offline or something. But here's the three stages. Only thing we really added was this part. We still needed the topic name, but now it's in a helper method. Um, and then we do something to the UI. What we can do is we already got the topic value. Segment, array, segment. All right, so does that make sense now? So we are parsing out the value at the top. Let me scroll up a little bit. Here we go. So we've already done this before. Uh, Sorry, where where do you usually put your cursor when you want to show it before the line? Here we go. So we're getting the topic name in a nice um, helper method, extension helper method. And we're de decoding the payload of that value. And then we create one instance of an MQTT data item. Prior to today, we weren't putting it into a class. We were just assigning it right to a UI element directly with the backing field. But now that we need to save it, we need that model to give to Unity Framework to put into the database. Now we have the item, we use the data service we just added and just add the thing, it'll get saved. So if we run this, I'll save it. The only other thing, um, I think Ed, you have to do this, if you can go to this class here, resolve that, and then move that type into another file. Where did it go? Oh, yeah. So you know the trick that you can make that another class? Yeah. There we go. Here we go. Now we don't forget that there's like a hidden class in that one. And I think what we should see, if you run it, um, and start subscribing, we should start seeing items being added to the database. Uh, so here's a good question. Uh, I know basic.net core worked with serve, uh, with worker services, console apps, class libraries. How do I get started with blazer? Do I need to know ASP.net before blazer? Um, so I, I would say, yes, you probably should know uh, about ASP.NET before Blazor. Uh, Blazor is part of ASP.NET. Um, so you're going to run into like web server things that you will probably want to understand, like uh, what's happening in the program CS file, how things get served to the client. Uh, there is a server and WebAssembly interactivity mode. So there's a couple uh, things that you'll have to wrap your head around as far as how Blazor operates and sends things to clients. Um, I can post some resources here in, uh, in chat in just a moment. Let me go look those up. But there's some good books, getting started guides and things that I can refer for you. There's a nice Microsoft Learn course too that is um, from the beginning of this year, still pretty relevant. Yeah, we've got an ebook up on our Telerik website as well. So here, I'll pull this on screen so you can all see it real quick. Uh, so I'm up at telerik.com slash white papers. I'll, pa I'll paste the final link in chat as well. But uh, let's see, it is not not our planning. There's a couple of ebooks up here that might be ha helpful. Um, but the one I'm looking for is like a full book for Blazor, Blazor Beginner's Guide. Is this one? 
to see if this is the one. Now, this is the one that I wrote, which is a little dated. There's a better copy up here that is actually by, I believe it's Manning. Let's see if this is it. Nope, that's the one I wrote as well. <laughs> We've got several ebooks up here. I'll look for it off screen again for a minute. Let me see if I can find the exact one. Okay, while you're doing that, I will come back to the homepage right. and recap what I expect to happen. We won't break anything. By the way, Ed, your, your two ebooks were pretty useful for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to share all of those out. There's one that's much more lengthy and in a lot more detail, written by David Pine. Uh, I'll post this one. And then, as far as like hardcover books, I will throw some recommendations. Unfortunately, they are not free, but fortunately, they are very good books. I'll just jump out to Amazon and find them. I know some good authors there. And then finally, there is a, this is not for the faint of heart. Uh, there is a workshop called a live project on Manning that I wrote. Um, those are written from a perspective of you're testing your knowledge as you read the book. Uh, some people like that approach. Some people did not like that approach. I am not the one who came up with the idea for that approach. That's how live projects work. So if that is something, if you want to be challenged on your Blazor knowledge um, as you learn, uh, check out the live project. Yeah, it's definitely the best way to get stuff to stick. Yeah. yeah read, it, read it and do it before you move on. Read it and do it before you move on. My absolute uh, highest recommendation for that is if you do not want to take the entire uh, live project, do project number two, which deals with unit testing. And you will get um, started from, like, you'll get past, like, the beginner part of the book or the project. And it will give you a project that um, requires some refactoring and unit testing. And you're tasked with writing those unit tests. Uh, so that, that one right there, I highly recommend. Teach you early, get those tests on there. It's... Uh, it's even if you don't ever plan on using the unit testing portion of it, that part of the the live project really uh, cements the component architecture of Blazor really well. Um, it, it shows you why you know interfaces are important. Um, how like uh, you might have a big component that needs to be broken down into smaller pieces, and that's going to those unit tests are going to kind of identify where those subcomponents will come from. So it's, it's a really good uh, like practice to go through. So excellent question. Definitely love questions like that. And then uh, let's see. We've got... so I did try to build, uh, but it, you need to approve the share and oh. do, do a build. Wow, always there we go. But it should build fine. Um, everything I added while you guys were talking was just cleaning it up, no new functionality, um, just making it look prettier so we can see it. And right now it's just going to build, make sure I didn't forget a namespace or something. It looks like it's working fine. We'll connect some data here so the charts don't look so blah. <laughs> and there we go. It should not have deployed. Is that the last instance? Uh, it's yeah, running. that's the last instance. Okay. I only did a build though. Oh, I ran it. I ran oh. it. Oh. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> like magic. <laughs> so all of these should be dumping into our database, right? Uh, did I set it to true? I did. I did not. So okay, oh, okay. stop debugging, and then let's change that flag to <laughs> true. It's on uh, line 34. Some people don't like feature flags like this, but this is just for testing or just- Yeah, so I don't blow up the database exactly, yeah. yeah. Like this wouldn't be our shipping feature. Because one thing I'm concerned about is, are we adding items too fast? Should we batch them? Like we're batching the UI? Um, 
that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, it is showing oh, all of the commands come through. Look at that. Yeah. So I guess it is on by default. Yeah. Or something I added in the code triggers it. So those are going into the database really quickly. And I don't notice a problem. That's another reason why I liked using SQLite because there's no network connect. The, there is a network connection from the browser and the process, but is it different than waiting for the round trip to SQL Server and back here? Uh, with with Blazor Server, I don't think there's any. Uh, it's all in memory. Yeah, it's all nice. it's all running server side. Um, Let's look real quick. I know you guys got to head out here in a second. I just want to dive into, I'm trying to remember if it's in, I think it's in the DB context where that gets set. Uh, oh, I'm not in Solution Explorer. Why? Where's my Solution Explorer? There we go. Um, I think it's a DB context where that verbose mode gets turned on. And I don't, I don't see it. I don't see the option. I think it's in the options. So it could come from program CS. Yeah, so you would do the same there. option right there. So you do O dot something. Right yeah, on, like, I don't see it in there either. You used to really have to fight to get that turned on. Um, it's just on by default now. You have to turn yeah. it off. Yeah, like I said, it, they, they turned it off because I think it's a security thing. Like, well, try a release build. I'm hmm. curious if... Uh, if it'll still do that and release. Yeah, let's double check. <laughs> we have to start it. And but yeah. the browser, like, I'm not getting, it's not hosting. I Don't see uh, an LL. error on mine. See an error on yours? Yeah, we have a database error where SQLite master type table root page is not no. All right, close it. Sure. Maybe we have to do a rebuild because the the release bin folder does not have the database file. Oh, okay. Strange though, it didn't blow up at all on mine. There yeah. it goes. That did yeah. the trick. When in doubt, rebuild, right? Yeah. I so still see it. it. Yep. Yeah. Only I'll put. And there, it, you can tell by the fact that it's the info flag because when you I'll put to the console, you have a few options. You have info, you have warning, you have error. There are different levels that you can use the log option. And yeah. they're all info, which is interesting. Okay. So maybe there's a logger. I don't see any logger set up either, though. Well, I didn't intentionally set it up, set it up, so I imagine we might have to intentionally disable it, which is curious. Yeah, I could have swore that was like. I mean, you don't necessarily want all of your see your queries in the clear, so people can read what's happening there. Yeah. Um. So I'm surprised above that, that it's noisy. Like, how am I going to see? Uh, you know, some other little error in between all of the database chatter. Yeah, I, when I did here, uh, I can look real quick here. If we go to GitHub, there is a, this is the old Blazing Coffee demo that I wrote. I doubt this even runs anymore, so we'll just look at it here. Yeah, I've gotten uh, a few support tickets. I want this rebuilt. <laughs> oh, yeah this was a good project if you want a good learning project um this is a good project i don't know if it still runs the older version of net i'll drop it in chat as well it's a you'll you'll need a uh teller license so i mean just looking through the source code i don't know if you'll be able to run it but um project structure wise it's a pretty good sample but it's it's a full-fledged app if you want to see what a full-fledged app looks like but in program CS, I think I had it turned on in here. So it's not program CS. Let's look under, or no, it's not services either. Cheyenne, which app are you asking about? You mean the one we just ran that was in dark theme? 
Oh, he's, yeah, he's probably talking about the one we were just running. Property services. Um, pages. Where is my DB context at? Context. So th this is the old migrate code. Remember I said, like, it changes every time. There's the context uh, DB migrate. Yeah, so Cheyenne, the app that you just saw is the app that we're building in this series. It is a solar powered monitor app. Um, we have all of the last episodes. So this is a series you can watch up until now where we built it until now and how we made the UI um, and where we got our UI accelerator templates. Then we have these templates on, on Teller.com where you can go in and grab parts of the page and just use it. And that's why it looks so good so quickly. So it used to be on on configuring, you would have to call options, enable sensitive data logging. And you also had to use the logger factory. So we had to uh, specifically tell it it was a console logger and then log the data to the console. That seems to not be the case anymore. Let's look, we don't have anything in on configuring and then I didn't see you pass that to the options builder. <laughs> so that's got to be on by default now, right? I found it. So go to program CS. <clears throat> uh, uh, CS. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so right there, make a new line and do O dot. So we're going to check in the options and there you should see enable sensitive data logging. Probably false. Is it equals false? Yeah. And then I believe a semicolon at the end for this one. So let's see if that does it. But that used to be off off by default. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if this is a bug. No, it's still there. It's still there. So it's another it's flag. <laughs> it's got to be something with logging. Like you said, the info yeah. bit is on there. I don't think it shows that with the... Maybe it does. I don't remember. I don't remember. I know really, I specifically had to tell it to yeah. turn it on with this. I'm not necessarily sure that is that output is in the same plumbing pipeline as the database logging. It might be like console log or some other thing, but I'm going to look into that. Yeah, that's interesting. That team. Uh, the things you notice when you've had to struggle to get the feature and then it's just there. <laughs> it's like, careful what you wish for. It's like, now it's free. Like, we, we've been through those, like, cycles with other stuff. Like, we used to get, um, like, Entity Framework used to get the, like, child um, fields like anything that's got a, um, what do you call it? Um, relation would come for free. Like if I have uh, an ID that has a foreign key, you'd get all that information for, you know, just for using any framework. And now you have to add it uh, because it's bad performance to do it all, all the time. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, if you had like four foreign keys in one model, that's a lot of other lookups. Yeah. If somebody tries to get a count on something and pulls like 30,000 records of everything in every field. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we, we need to wrap up. I know you guys need to get yeah. back to uh, helping clients today. And um, we will be back next week for another Blazer Solar Power Hour. So we will see you then. Take care. <laughs>